In January 1984, after three years of waiting, Yoko finally gave fans what they'd been waiting for, John Lennon's last solo album. This month sees the 40th anniversary of the release of Milk and Honey, a top 10 album in its time, but one which is virtually forgotten today. I'm Andrew from Parlogram, and in this video, we'll look not just only at the making of this album, but also find out how it was received in the British press and how it stands up today. As 1984 dawned, it seemed that the world had gotten over the events of December 1980, and there was only one Beatle everyone was talking about. Say 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 was at number one in the US, while at the same time, the Pipes of Peace single hit the top spot in the UK. I was having a great time in 1984. I was 17 and still in school, but working two evenings a week in Waitrose supermarket, which meant I had money to spend on records. And there was no shortage of great ones to buy that year. Q Montage. The TV was pretty good too, and there being only four channels in Britain at that time, we watched whatever was on, which was mostly good fun. For example, 1984 started off in excellent fashion on New Year's Day, with a brand new Granada documentary called The Early Beatles. It included film of the Beatles at the Cavern, as well as other TV and newsreel footage, which was being shown for the first time since its original broadcast. It was fascinating stuff, and I still have my VHS recording of the programme to this day, which you're now looking at. Then, on January the 9th, almost three years since the release of Watching the Wheels, came the news we'd all been waiting for. Nobody Told Me has started life in the mid-70s as a demo called Everyone's Talking, Nobody's Talking and like many of that era, was recorded by John at his piano in the Dakota, accompanied by a beatbox. The song expressed John's frustrations with his and modern life in general, and, true to form, included some memorable lyrics and wordplay. Although his demo included many of the lines which ended up in the finished song, they weren't quite yet in the right order. For example, the line in the demo, There's a little green hill far away, just below the stairs, would be replaced in the release version by There are Nazis in the bathroom, just below the stairs. That line was inspired by a 1911 poem by J. Milton Hayes called The Green Eye of the Yellow God, which originally read like this. There's a one-eyed yellow idol to the north of Kathmandu. There's a little marble cross below the town. There's a broken-hearted woman tends the grave of Mad Karoo, and the yellow god forever gazes down. This was a poem or monologue which would have been well known to those of John's generation, especially by those who grew up listening to radio shows like The Goons. Another line in the song, They're starving back in China, so finish what you got, was another phrase commonly heard by the post-war generation, and was certainly one which you could imagine Aunt Mimi saying to John. Another line in the song, There are UFOs over New York and I ain't too surprised, was inspired by his own sighting of a UFO, which he wrote about in the liner notes to his Walls and Bridges album, and talked about on camera to the BBC. Up there, I saw a UFO, and it went down the river, turned right at the United Nations, <laughs> turned left, and then down the river. The song also appears on a list John wrote when it was still in the demo stage, where he was adding notes about the type of sound he was going for on each. After Nobody Told Me, he wrote Instant Karma. And it's true, the song does have a kind of Instant Karma vibe about it, and even begins with the same 3-4 counting. D four. D four. A video was made to accompany the single, which my diary reminds me that I first saw on the Saturday morning kids TV show, Saturday Superstore, on January the 14th. The video was a different one to the one which accompanies the ultimate mix of this track on YouTube today. 
Also on that day, BBC Radio 1 broadcast a new interview with Yoko by Andy Peebles. Carried out at the Dakota, the hour-long interview played tracks from the forthcoming album and talked about how things have been going for Yoko and Sean since their last meeting on December the 8th, 1980. There is a recording of that interview on YouTube and I'll put a link to it in the description. But here's John in that legendary 1980 BBC interview talking about the follow-up to Double Fantasy. Do you feel now at this stage, here we are in December 1980, that the team and the ease of writing is now back with you? And, yes. that, and that you're going to be extremely prolific in the months and years to come? Yes, I think it's going to be a one period, they say. Those two will do anything for publicity, for Christ's <laughs> sake, get them off the front page, you know, get them out. The, you know, people are bitching at us because we were always doing something and then they were bitching at us because we weren't doing anything and I have a funny feeling that it's going to be the other way around again because we're talking and talking and talking and there's all sorts of plans and ideas we have in our head it's just a matter of getting it done you know we already got half the next album and uh, we'll probably go in just after Christmas and do that and we're already talking about what the uh, the idea the of the album. third album is already mm. laid out, and I can't wait, you know. So it's a matter of just getting it done. The and I'm sorry about you people that get fed up of hearing about it, but, <laughs> you know, we like to do it, so it's too bad. This is my original copy of the single, complete with... record... and... original till receipt from the shop WH Smiths which cost £1.35. pence. There you go, I told you I'd need it one day. Well? Now, I loved this single then, and I still love it now. But how was it received by the British music press at the time? Well, here's the review from the New Musical Express, or NME, as it now liked to be called. It's surprisingly complimentary and deserves to be read in full, so here goes. Lennon was always the sharpest, wildest and most cynical of the Beatles. And this little ditty shows that his greasy spoon candour of yesteryear is today's emblem of integrity. Nobody Told Me examines various familiar forms of dislocation between appearance and reality, words and meanings, east and west. If it stopped there, then it would be about our very own working class hero being lost in the labyrinths of a rich kid's revulsion from the world. And my advice to him would have been to go out and get pissed as a newt and not bother us with these trifles. But Nobody Told Me glides along the simplest of rock and roll riffs, leaving Lennon's voice exposed and revealing a basic tone of wonder at the monumental arbitrariness of the world order he has uncovered. His refusal to accept what he sees makes it all sound as if there's hope of change, makes the pain of absurdity bearable, and makes this song, garrulous as it is, a valiant piece of common sense which will run and run. Although the press were predicting it would replace Pipes of Peace at number one, nobody told me only made it to number six in the UK. Pipes of Peace was in fact replaced at number one by Frankie Goes to Hollywood's Relax, a song which incidentally was banned from being played on BBC television and radio. Nobody told me went one better in the States and made number five on the Billboard Hot 100, which set the stage nicely for the release of the album. Yoko along with an eight-year-old Sean, flew into the UK a few days before Milk and Honey's January the 27th release, and the first place they went was to Liverpool. This high-profile visit was Sean's first to the birthplace of his father and was covered extensively in the press. Their first stop was Strawberry Fields, where they joined the staff in prayer, after which they moved on to 251 Menlove Avenue, the house where John lived with his aunt Mimi whom they later visited at a friend's house where she was recovering from illness. After a whistle-stop tour of the city, mostly from the back of a car, Sean gave reporters a weary smile and in a quote which would have made his father proud said, For the hundredth time, I love it. Meanwhile, on that very same day, Paul was supporting Linda at Uxbridge Magistrates Court where they were appearing at Linda's trial for smuggling 4.9 grams of cannabis with a street value of £4.90 through Heathrow Airport. During proceedings, it emerged in evidence that Linda had a take-home wage of just £50 a week. In the end, she pleaded guilty and was fined £75. Potty Linda did it for thrills, said friends the next day, 
which was followed in the coming days by more hilarious headlines and regretful interviews. Released on January the 27th, 1984, Milk and Honey became John's eighth and final album. The title Milk and Honey was Yoko's idea and carried two meanings. Firstly, in the scripture, the land of milk and honey is where you go after you die. And secondly, because people wishing to immigrate to the US think of it as being the land of milk and honey. The album's artwork was strikingly similar to Double Fantasy, but this time came with a gatefold. In an interview in the NME from February the 11th, Yoko revealed that the original idea for the album cover was for them to appear as a latter-day Elizabeth and Robert Browning in a passport photo looking at each other and holding hands. In the end, though, the album's artwork used photographs from the same session as those on Double Fantasy, taken by Japanese photographer Kishin Shinoyama, who sadly passed away a few weeks ago on January the 4th, aged 83. However, unlike Double Fantasy, which had 14 tracks, Milk and Honey comprised only 12, which were divided equally between John and Yoko. But although the artwork and track listing format was similar to Double Fantasy, that's where the similarities end, as between Double Fantasy and the release of Milk and Honey, Yoko had fallen out with two important people associated with that first album. Firstly was the split with David Geffen, whose label Double Fantasy and her first solo album after that Seasons of Glass had appeared on. Secondly, and perhaps more significantly, Yoko lost trust or fell out with Double Fantasy's producer, Jack Douglas. Even though Douglas had recorded the sessions for John's tracks, he was not credited anywhere on Milk and Honey, which she understandably sued for. And in April 1984, just a few months after the album's release, a Manhattan jury ordered Yoko to pay Douglas more than two and a half million dollars, or two million pounds. And at the trial, Douglas produced a copy of the contract, giving him a 4% share of the royalties. Stripped of Double Fantasy's polished production, John's songs on Milk and Honey certainly have a raw feel, which I think suits them. But at the same time, it would have been interesting to hear what Douglas would have done with them. Whereas John's tracks appear on this album in almost demo form, Yoko's tracks by contrast are very polished and contemporary sounding. And that's because hers were recorded in 1983 by a completely different set of musicians. Instead of using the original Double Fantasy crew, she used some of the same band she'd used on her 1981 album, Seasons of Glass, which incidentally had already been deleted in the UK by the time Milk and Honey was released. She also completely re-recorded Don't Be Scared, despite there being a 1980 version of the track available. Reviews of Milk and Honey appeared in all the music papers the following week. Record Mirror's review was fairly sanguine and went like this. If you find the Lennon's public display of love a little tiresome, there's plenty to wince at, but equally much to be touched by if it moves you. Lennon's songs have moments of haunting simplicity, even if they do tend to sound over-Americanized. I'm stepping out and I don't want to face it, even sound like early talking heads. The Back to Basics feel retains the essence of Lennon's talent with words and music, that very thing that has been so overanalyzed in the past and will be again and again in the future. But it doesn't need explaining to the ears. Jangly rock rhythms, simple emotions, very private feelings shared with the world for the last time. C'est tout. In a review titled Sweet and Sour, the melody makers Colin Irwin gave his honest and I think fairly accurate opinion of the album. If you'd like to read this review in full, simply pause the video, then pinch and zoom in on your phone or tablet. But here's the first part of it, which I think really hits the mark. One of the most neglected tragedies of John Lennon's murder was that it meant he left on an all-time artistic low. Discounting the sentimental considerations, which isn't easy, Double Fantasy was an appalling album, probably the worst ever to carry his name, sickening in its complacency and twee love rhymes. John was happy at last and nobody could begrudge him that, but it sure made a mess of his artistic edge. Double Fantasy was intended as a rebirth, but events took over and it became a wake. Trivial and tepid, it was the least appropriate requiem a genius could have had. Had he lived, Milk and Honey might have been the album to have restored his musical muscle. Certainly the single Nobody Told Me 
suggests that he was rediscovering his more natural, fiery nature. With mentions of Nazis in the bathroom, the starving Chinese and yellow idols in Kathmandu, it's a million times more enigmatic than Pipes of Peace, that's for sure. On Nobody Told Me, Lennon still seems a little muted. Not genuinely angry, the way he did it is most compelling, but at least he sounds aware, which is much more than can be said about any of Double Fantasy. Whether or not he would have used Nobody Told Us, me, as a stepping stone to regain his greatness is of course pure conjecture. Instead, we are left with a mishmash of demos, cassette recordings and incomplete tracks, fleshed out with half an album's worth of new Yoko Ono songs. He ends the review by saying, It's a sad, poignant epitaph, merely the crumbs of the Lennon revival. But crumbs are all you're getting, so make the most of them. The NME's review, intriguingly entitled Curtain Call for the Odd Couple, is not as concise or as intelligent as the Melody Makers, and is little more than a long ramble, clearly written while listening to the album, and ultimately fails to give any meaningful critical opinion on the album itself. Milk and Honey performed respectably in the UK album charts where it reached number three. Record buyers in the US were less enthusiastic, where the album only made it to number 11 on the Billboard 200. March the 9th saw the release in the UK of the second single from the album, Borrowed Time, a single which wouldn't be released in the US until May the 11th. Inspired by the line Living on Borrowed Time from Bunny Whaler's Hallelujah Time, which he'd heard during his sailing holiday from Newport, Rhode Island to Bermuda in the summer of 1980, Lennon commented that Living on Borrowed Time was exactly what he was doing, but then said, Come to think of it, it's what we're all doing, even though most of us don't like to face it. On his notes for sound, John wrote reggae bass line and Herb Alpert horn solo, which of course was not the way it turned out. Unlike Nobody Told Me, the British press were less enthusiastic about the single, which was reviewed in all the music papers on March the 10th. The Melody Maker wrote, Anybody who allowed their hopes to be raised by the manifestly acceptable though hardly startling nobody told me, is in for severe shock treatment. Quite honestly, borrowed time is a bit of an embarrassment, the kind of pallid waste that white rock bands used to produce around 1972 when they wanted to show they were hip dudes. Really, and just to prove it, here's some reggae. Anyone remember Led Zeppelin's Jamaica, or something? This is undignified and should be ceased forthwith. Can't the man rest in peace? A rambling NME review summed it up in three words. It's no good. And Sounds reviewed it along with Dead or Alive's That's The Way and Scott Walker's Track 3, where it was described as a wishy-washy sliver of cod reggae, which is nauseatingly, though undeniably attractive. UK record buyers didn't pay much attention to it either, and it managed only three weeks at the lower end of the top 40, peaking at number 32. The third and final single from the album was Stepping Out, which was released on March the 15th in the US, but not until July in the UK. John's sound notes showed that he wanted heavy bass guitar on the track, a la Let's Get Serious by Jermaine Jackson. But again, it didn't turn out that way. The release garnered very little attention from the music press in the UK, where Record Mirror preferred madness to the Beatles and thought nobody should be buying John Lennon records anyway. The Melody Maker predicted, it'll be a hit, it's quite poppy, which it wasn't. Of Lennon's other tracks on the album, I Don't Wanna Face It was, in my opinion, just as strong as nobody told me. But as funky as it is, I think it's one of the least developed tracks of this album, and his lead vocal would surely have been redone. On his sound notes, John obviously thought it was too fast, and wrote that it should be played laid back LA style, with a Havana Moon by Chuck Berry sound on the chorus. Havana Moon. Although a polished sounding demo, Forgive Me My Little Flower Princess is the weakest of John's songs on this album, and indeed might not have made it onto the album had John lived, but who knows. Grow Old With Me is a beautiful song, and along with Yoko's Let Me Count the Ways, was originally meant to be the linchpin of the album. Unfortunately, the ghostly sound of the cassette demo on this album doesn't do it any favours, and the fact that it's one of the last songs John recorded makes it difficult to listen to, and certainly 
doesn't do the song justice. For me, the song is better heard when it's sung by someone else. Both Glenn Campbell and Mary Chapin Carpenter's renditions are superb. Ringo also recorded a version for his album What's My Name in 2019, which featured Paul McCartney on backing vocals. Links to YouTube videos of all three of those versions are in the description. But this was of course not how it was all supposed to have been. The plan, had John lived, was to continue with promo work for Double Fantasy into early 1981, which would have included both domestic and international travel, along with a random show or two. He would then go back into the studio to finish off Milk and Honey in late 1981, after which he and Yoko would have embarked on a full tour. But there was no guarantee that John would have used any or all of the six songs that were eventually released on this album in 1984. For example, Nobody Told Me was supposedly going to Ringo for his album. John could have also revived and reworked Free as a Bird, Real Love or even Now and Then. For me, at the time of its release, Milk and Honey felt like a gift from the gods and I played it to death during those first few months of 1984. But to be honest, it's spent very little time on my turntable since. And it's an album which doesn't make me feel as sad as Double Fantasy does. And now I'm older, I'm fonder of it than I was at 17. As far as sound quality goes, the original vinyl sounds fine, but my preferred and recommended way of listening to it is on this West German manufactured 1984 CD. It's still easy to find and can be had for as little as five euros or dollars on Discogs. I'll put a link to it in the description. Finally, I'd like to finish up by quoting the Lennon website on this album, which I think sums it up nicely. Though Milk and Honey was, of necessity, a posthumous album, it's not a memorial. Its tone is only momentarily elegiac. Several songs are by turns rowdy, optimistic, comic and frankly sensual. To Yoko Ono fell the task of presenting John's final work in a properly coherent setting in line with the plans they had already made for the record after Double Fantasy. And his complex personality is superbly captured. Decades have now passed since Milk and Honey was conceived, but our fascination with this extraordinary man has not diminished. His songs do not lose their power to move, excite or enlighten us. Thank you so much for watching this, our first anniversary video of 2024. There's lots more to come in the year ahead, so if you like what we're doing, please do hit the subscribe button as it really helps the channel grow. I'll be back next week with another anniversary special, but from 60 years ago. Find out what that is next weekend, or join us on Patreon for a sneak preview sometime during the week. But that's all for this time, so I'll say bye for now, and thanks for watching. Great. Thank you so much. Pleasure, pleasure. I have learned a hell of a lot. Oh, good. I'm glad. That's all right.